Thank you, Kieran, and welcome to everybody to this webinar. So tonight we're going to look at wound dressings and specifically those wound dressings that will be used or asked for in the pharmacy setting. But before we think about wound dressings, we need to think about the patient. And as you can see on the slide, it says that the impact of living with the wound and its treatment can only be seen, can be seen in different ways by different people. But truly only the person who has the wound understands what that is and what it means to them. So we always have to keep that in mind, that the wound is unique to the person who has the wound. Every wound is different. So we cannot make assumptions about one wound based on another wound. So as we go through the uh, presentation, we will go through each phase of the wound healing process and we will look at the dressing selection as we go through that wound healing process. And we will look at what the wound should look like at that time, what we should be looking to do at that time in the wound healing process and what we need the dressing to do. So when you get a wound, whether that is a paper cut or a very large abdominal wound, the body's response is exactly the same. The body assumes you're going to bleed to death. So that's the immediate assumption of the body. And the body sets up an action to stop you bleeding to death. And that action is called hemostasis or clot formation. And it doesn't matter, as I said, whether this is a simple paper cut or whether it's a very large wound. That start of the healing process is identical. And what happens is, is the blood vessels immediately narrow in response to the emergency of having a break in the skin. This prevents excess blood loss because the wound is, the body is assuming you're going to bleed to death. So to, to limit that and to prevent that excess blood loss, the blood vessels will narrow. At the same time, the platelets that come out of the damaged blood vessel clump together. And you could think of that as a bit like if you had a whole lot of little pieces of blue tack and you put them uh, between your fingers and you made them into one piece of blue tack. And that is uh, like a blue tack plug. And in a wound, we call that a platelet plug. And you can see that on the bottom right hand picture that you see this platelet plug at the um, wound point on the body. So now that it, the, the, the bleeding has stopped, the blood vessels have narrowed and the wound has been plugged by a platelet. And if you look at the next time you have even a paper cut or a small wound yourselves, just watch it and you will see how that platelet plug, plug forms and you can see that on the fingertip in the bottom left hand corner. What happens then is, is that once the body knows that the blood loss has been stopped, the blood vessels open again because the only way for the healing cells to get to the area of the wound is through the blood vessels. So therefore the blood vessels now have to open to allow those healing cells to get into um, the area of the wound. And coming from those damaged blood vessels, we have plasma, which also aids in that process. All of that gives us redness, heat and inflammation. They are the signs of uh, hemostasis. We have redness, heat and inflammation. And you'll see that even in the smallest of wounds, right up to the largest of wounds, you will get this redness, heat and inflammation. So at that time in the wound, the wound is bleeding. It may have some clear exudate. Now exudate is the term we use for the fluid that comes out of a wound. So we may have some clear exudate coming out. What we need to do is irrigate the wound with some saline or even tap water is suitable. Uh, clean it and then we need to cover and protect it. We want the dressing at this point to absorb any exudate and any blood and we want it to provide what we call moist wound healing and that is simply stopping a scab from forming and we looked at we will look at that in later slides as to why we need to do that we will also go through each of those dressing categories that might be suitable at this point of the wound healing process so this is only going to take minutes. Once that has happened, once we have hemostasis, then the wound really starts then to get into this, what we call the physiology of wound healing. So this is the inflammatory phase of healing. And this is the phase of healing where the wound starts to get cleansed and cleaned of all the things that are in it uh, which need to be removed before the healing process can really get going 
and that starts by the first cell that comes into the wound at this time which is called a neutrophil. Neutrophil is a white blood cell and it engulfs the bacteria through a process known as phacocytosis. So it engulfs the bacteria that's in the wound and once it has done that job it dies. And when it dies, we see it on a wound as slough. And slough is what you see on the bo that bottom right hand picture. It's yellow, white, um, custard like consistency that we often see on wounds. And it's a good sign because it means that the white blood cells are working and it means that the wound is being cleansed, which is what we want to happen at this point. As these neutrophils die, they send out a message to the next cell, which is a macrophage. The macrophages are the big eaters and they come into the wound called in by the neutrophils as they die and they then consume the dead neutrophils. So the macrophages start cleaning those neutrophils out of the wound, the dead neutrophils. They also uh, remove some bacteria from the wound and they also remove any damaged tissue that is in the wound. Also at this point, protease levels will rise and they will help to break down the damaged tissue. These are enzymes and we, they will break down the damaged tissue to help the macrophages to engulf them and remove them. All through this, at this time of the inflammatory phase of healing, our exudates levels will rise. And you see this particularly in wounds on the lower leg, perhaps a venous leg ulcer, which have a lot of exudate, which is dragged down to the lower leg by gravity, and then there's a wound and you get a lot of exudate coming out of that wound. So for this, what we want the dressing to do then, at this stage of the healing process, is we need it to manage the exudate. And this is when the wound is in this stage of healing, really a simple band-aid or a simple elastoplast is not often suitable because there is a lot of exudate coming from the wound and we need what we would call a dressing rather than a plaster. And we also need to keep uh, the wound in a moist state and provide it with moist wound healing. And as I said, I'll explain that later. But lots of dressing categories may be suitable at this time. And that is always dependent on the level of exudate that is coming from the wound. But it's this point in time that the wound can stop healing. And this happens when barriers to healing kick in. Now those barriers to healing are very many of them and they include things like uh, patients that may be on steroids, they include uh, poor nutrition, uh, it includes underlying disease such as arterial disease or venous disease and any of these barriers to healing, when they kick in then, the wound healing process stops and the wound enters what we call a vicious cycle of chronicity or it becomes what we call chronic. So there's no, the, when we use the term chronic, it's not a particular type of wound, it's where the wound is in the healing process. And it's at this point, at the inflammatory, the end of the inflammatory stage, that if these barriers to kick in, then the wound healing process stops and we get what we will call a chronic wound that stays in the cycle of chronicity. But we're going to assume that there's no barriers to healing and this wound is going to move on. And it moves out of that inflammatory stage now into what we call proliferation. And the proliferation stage starts with granulation, granulation tissue coming into the wound. Now at this stage, the surrounding skin should be returning to pink and normal. We should be losing that redness and that heat. And the wound begins to heal from the bottom up. It begins to fill from the bottom up which what we, with what we call granulating tissue. And as it does that, we get new blood vessels appearing in the wound and this is called angiogenesis. And the angiogenesis um, uh, process is stimulated by the macrophages. So you see as one part of the wound healing process uh, stops and we move into another, or as one cell leaves the wound, that as we, the messages are sent out, which starts the next stage of the healing process. So as the macrophages leave the wound, they send out signals and we start the process of angiogenesis. We also start the process of fibroblasts coming into the wound. Now fibroblasts are the main cell in the wound healing process. They are the, 
the cell that is the cell that's going to build our new tissue. And that's also stimulated by the macrophages. Now, the fibroblasts are really interesting. And any of you work, those of you uh, tomorrow go into your pharmacy and have a look at all the products that are on shelves in the pharmacy that have collagen in them. And collagen is important to us because it gives our skin its elasticity and strength. And that comes from the fibroblasts. So the fibroblasts come into the wound, they divide and they produce collagen. And the angiogenesis and the fibroblasts coming into the wound contribute to the building of the extracellular matrix, which is the new tissue, which is granulating tissue. So what we want the dressing to do at this point now is to protect the new granulating tissue. Our exudate level should be dropping, we should have very little slough left on the wound and we simply need to protect this granulating tissue and we do this again by moist wound healing. And you see in the, in the images at the bottom right hand of the screen, you can see some of the, the pictures there. The, the left picture has some slough still on it, but it also has granulation tissue on it. And then the picture on the right, we have no slough now. The slough is, is, is all leaving the wound and you can see those little islands of granulation. So once that process has finished and once that granulating tissue has reached the top of the wound then we move on to the next part of proliferation process and that is where the wound gets covered in what we call epithelial tissue and this is where moist wound healing is vital. So if you look at the two images of the at the bottom of the slide there. The one on the left you see has a black scab in it. So that's our wound that has been allowed to dry and we have a black scab. The, you can see the, epi, the red epithelial tissue at the migrating over the new skin and when it gets to the wound, when it gets to the scab, it has to go underneath the scab because epithelial tissue needs moisture in order for it to multiply and to migrate. So it has to go under the scab in order to find that moisture. However, if you look at the image to the right of that, you'll see there's a dressing on the wound. Under the dressing, the wound is moist. We haven't allowed a scab to form. So the epithelial tissue can then migrate directly underneath the dressing. It doesn't need to go under any scab and that will speed up that process and make that process much quicker. So the important thing at this stage, which you want to do at this stage, is to cover and protect that new epithelial tissue. So the dressing then must do that and the dressing must give us moist wound healing. So also at this time, the wound will start to contract and really wound contraction can be up to about 40%. So we're not trying to cover all of the wound with granulation and epithelial tissue. There will be some contraction as well. On the bottom right hand picture there, you see this pink skin. It's a pink purpley color sometime. That's epithelial tissue. It's very delicate and it absolutely needs to be protected. Once that has happened now, we have a wound which we might say is closed, but it's not healed. So that healing process can take up to two years. So at this point in time, in the early stage of this maturation, or, or the remodeling phase it's sometimes called, we do need to protect that because it is really heartbreaking if somebody finally gets, for instance, a leg ulcer healed and then they don't protect that new epithelial tissue and they knock their leg and the wound opens again and they're back then to the start of the wound healing process. So it's really important that the early stage of the maturation phase is to protect that skin and to make sure that uh, nothing is going to damage it. So at this time, the tensile strength in the wound is changing. This takes, as I say, up to about two years, uh, but it's never anything more than about 80% as strong as the original tissue was. So in, a, in someone who has um, oh, you know, uh, delicate skin or fragile skin, we really need to make sure that we protect that um, new tissue. So up to two years then, that can happen and uh, that, that remodeling is taking place. To go through those four phases of healing again then we have hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation or granulation tissue, that's when that happens then and then the remodeling or maturation can take up to two years.
What we need to understand is that this occurs in overlapping phases. So a wound is not just in one phase and then moves into the next phase. Parts of the wound can be in one phase, parts of the wound can be in a different phase. Um, so that's important then when we are making our dressing choices, that we make sure we choose a dressing that is suitable for the phases of healing that the wound is in based on the tissue that's in the wound. And we also understand that if the wound gets stuck in the inflammatory phase and doesn't move out into that proliferation phase, then we have what we would call a chronic wound. And as I said, the a chronic wound is not a type of wound, any wound, a paper cut can become a chronic wound if it doesn't heal. So any wound that doesn't go through this phase of healing in this order and in this time uh, frame becomes then what we would call a chronic wound. So when we go then to choose our dressing uh, that might go, we, we might put on our wounds, these are the criteria of an ideal dressing. But actually, I don't even want you to even think about those or try and remember those. Really, um, my criteria for an ideal dressing is the right dressing on the right wound at the right time. And once we keep remembering that, and once we, we base our choice on making sure that we're, we're doing that, then we will choose a dressing that is suitable for healing. But the problem is, is that we have all these dressing categories. Now these dressing categories um, have developed over the years and some of them are names that companies have, have made up in order to differentiate their product from another product and some of them are categories that have come down th through tenders and through um, uh, contracts with hospitals uh, such as you know the, the large hospitals and we get these names of categories and we build our dressings now through these categories but this can be confusing so how do we choose then which of these dressings goes on our wound well we do that by these principles of dressing choice and that is simply having an ongoing assessment of the needs of the wound and matching that to the functions of the dressing. Now the important word there is ongoing. We don't just assess a wound once, decide on a dressing and leave it at that because remember the wound is changing. The wound is going from one phase of healing to another phase of healing. So therefore the dressing may have to change, the type of dressing may have to change as we move through the healing process. So we remember that no single product is suitable for all wound types or all stages of the healing process. So we're going to go through now those categories of dressings. So the first category we look at is what we would sort of call a simple pad. So a simple pad like this, it um, has a non-adherent surface on it and this means that it won't stick to the surface of the wound and that's really important. We certainly do not put dry gauze on wounds anymore. Now simple pads are very suitable for wounds that have no barriers to healing and have very uh, low exudate, uh, something perhaps like a suture line, an abrasion or simple lacerations. But we must make sure that it doesn't dry out because remember we want to maintain moist wound healing. So we must make sure this pad doesn't dry out. So we don't, we again, we don't put this on a wound and leave it and say go you know we don't need to look at that again we do need to keep an eye on these pads when they're on wounds to make sure that a scab hasn't formed underneath them so low to mod low low to no exudate and very good as i say on abrasions or lacerations and either side can be used and they also come with a an adhesive border if uh, you want that the next category we look at is what we would call a primary wound contact layer and this is a category which really was developed many many years ago to protect the new tissue from the dressing which would go over it. So uh, before we had dressings such as foam dressings we might have wanted to put gauze on a wound in order to absorb but we understood we didn't want to put gauze directly on a wound so primary wound contact layers were developed and as you see there they are a mesh and they go down onto the wound and then you put something over it and you try to put something over it which will keep that wound moist. And they are indicated for a variety type of wounds. In the hospital setting, they're used hugely on uh, partial thickness burns and they're used on donor sites. 
Uh, they're great on skin abrasions and superfi any superficial wound, these are very suitable on, but we must cover them, we cannot leave them, we must cover them, and we must remember that they are not wound uh, moist wound healing in themselves, because imagine if you allowed that to dry out and the exudate from the wound gets stuck on that, when you remove it, then you remove all that new tissue. Hydrogels um, contain up to 96% water and these are particularly suitable in a pharmacy setting or in an accident and emergency setting as burn dressings and that is what they are used for in that setting. So those two sheets that you see are very useful on burns. They are cooling and they allow a burn to be kept cool and to cool a burn down. Very, very suitable and very useful first aid dressings for burns. Now on the bottom left hand corner, you see a, a, a gel that's come out of a tube and that's also a hydrogel, but that's the type of hydrogel which would be used in a hospital setting and that is really for putting on to wounds that have been allowed to become dry so perhaps somebody didn't come into the hospital early enough and they were dressing a wound themselves and the wound is now dry or maybe has a scab and in this case a hydrogel an amorphous hydrogel as it's known as would be used then to rehydrate that scab to rehydrate that dry necrotic tissue and to try to um, to, to make it moist and wet so that it can be removed and then we can start with moist wound healing. So hydrogels, sheet hydrogels, very suitable on burns um, and uh, the amorphous hydrogel more used in a hospital setting. Foam dressings are um, really the medical version of cling film. That, this is what these are essentially and these give us moist wound healing. They were one of the first dressings we had that truly gave us moist wound healing. However, they don't absorb anything. So while they are transparent and they are flexible, uh, they don't uh, absorb anything. So they're on, of no value on a wound which has moderate levels of exudate. They only have value on wounds that have very low exudate. They are used primarily now in a hospital setting as an IV dressing. Uh, they're sometimes used perhaps um, over a suture line to stop the sutures catching in clothing, or they may be used to protect skin from friction. If uh, uh, there is a concern uh, on, an, on a heel perhaps that there is friction. Now if you look at the photo of that arm and that elbow, this is a great photo because it has everything in it that you need to remember about wounds. So you have, first of all, underneath the elbow, you have a scab. You have that dry uh, tissue that has been allowed to dry out and you have a scab. Now in order for that to heal correctly, that scab needs to be moistened and we need to start the healing process again. Of course, what will happen is, is that whoever has that, owns that arm, will start picking at that scab and the scab will and we have another wound created so every time we pick at a scab and we see blood we have to start that healing process again the other part of the wound has been covered in a film dressing and you can see there you have the slough underneath the film dressing as we would see in this type of very superficial wound and then you have the granulation tissue. So if you simply left that film dressing on that wound, you would see more granulation tissue appearing. And as the, uh, the dressing is changed and we, we remove these dressings very carefully, we lift a corner and we stretch them horizontally away from the wound. Um, but as we do that, then we will see more granulation tissue forming because we are giving the wound moist wound healing. So the first dressing that we really got for, um, for wound healing that did a number of things for us were hydrocolloids. And some of you probably know the name Granuflex. It's been a lot, a, around a long time on the market. So Granuflex is a hydrocolloid, but actually also are Compi blister plasters, also are Medicare blister plasters. So all these little blister plasters, as you see on the little toe, these are also hydrocolloids. They're just very small hydrocolloids. But in a wound hospital, the hospital setting, hydrocolloids, we use the larger size of hydrocolloids and these really led this uh, revolution of moist wound healing because these are a barrier to liquids and 
they will manage moderate levels of exudate. Now they don't remove the exudate from the wound, but as you can see in the photo there, as the hydrocolloid absorbs the exudate from the wound, it fills the hydrocolloid and it turn, the hydrocolloid area turns white. And that is directly over the point of the blister or over the wound. And as it absorbs, it turns white. Now on a blister, as in that little toe, you could simply leave that hydrocolloid on until the blister had healed totally. Um, and the one above it also was a blister and you could leave that on. In a, uh, perhaps in a larger wound setting, you would be looking at, uh, removing the hydrocolloid once you see that white area getting to the edge and replace it with another one. Alginates are dressings that are derived from seaweed. So this is an alginate dressing and when you pick up an alginate dressing it's quite fibrous and it's very dry and it's quite fibrous and but once it comes on, once you put it on a wound and once it comes in contact with the exudate that is in the wound, there is a, a connection between the alginate, which as I said is seaweed based, and the moisture from the wound. And that turns this very dry, fibrous piece of fabric into a gel. So when you put the alginate into the wound and it comes in contact with the exudate, it turns jelly-like. So therefore, it removes gently and it removes very softly and it's very gentle and soft on a wound and um, is, very, uh, is very easy to use. Now, these dressings come in, in square shapes, but they also come in a ribbon shape or a rope shape. And that is, as you can see in that picture, to actually put into a deep wound. So the deep wound needs to be filled and the alginate goes into the wound and then gets covered with a secondary dressing. And these alginates will manage moderate to heavy le levels of exudate and over the years they were used usually in conjunction with a foam dressing, which is the next category that we're going to look at. So foam dressings um, are probably the most popular type of wound that's used on wounds today. And that is because they are very versatile and they are suitable for most wounds and they're suitable really for the wound through the healing process. Right through the healing process, we can use a foam dressing. They give us moist wound healing. They become in different shapes. You can get them for sacrum areas. You can get them for heel areas. They come with a border. Some come with a non-border. Um, and some come with uh, different types of adhesives. And we're going to look at that in the next slide. But what I want to explain to you here is, is how these dressings work. So when you get a, a, a foam dressing first, this is what it looks like. But when you put it down on the wound, it takes up the exudate from the wound into the dressing and it starts to look like this. So you can see here, I don't know whether you can see it on the camera, the, the water that I put this has filled into this dressing. So we will pretend that this water is exudate. So it has filled into the dressing and the dressing has bubbled down into the wound. So this gives that granulation tissue a lovely surface to, to, to actually grow on and to granulate on. So it takes up the exudate from the wound and exudate is mostly water. And the water content of the exudate then evaporates up through the back of the dressing, as you see in that photo. So all that's left in the dressing is the cellular component of the exudate, which is moist. But the, the water granu uh, evaporates up through the back of the dressing, and that's known as a moisture vapor transmission rate. And that allows what is really quite a thin dressing to actually take up and to manage large amounts of fluid coming from a wound because it's not trying to hold it all at the wound site. It's actually letting it evaporate up through the back of the dressing. Now these dressings, as this one here, as you see, has no adhesive border on it, but they do also come with adhesive borders. So this is, um, this is a foam dressing with an adhesive border. And as you can see, um, the adhesive border goes right around. The foam is the same, it works exactly the same way. And this uh, adhesive is known as an acrylic adhesive. And the thing about acrylic adhesives is, is that they are really very sticky. And when you put them on skin, they get stickier the longer they're left on. 
So if you put this on a, a, a wound now, tonight, Monday night, and you went to take it off on Friday, by Friday, this acrylic adhesive would really be very, very sticky. So when you go to remove it then, as you see in the bottom image there, when you go to remove it, you remove skin cells from around the wound and you start to create uh, an excoriation around the wound because you're removing the skin cells all the time. Every time you put a new one down, you remove it and you remove those skin cells. But it's a wonderful adhesive to use on a sacrum area or anywhere where you really want that dressing to stick. But you wouldn't want to use an acrylic adhesive, for instance, on a pretibial laceration or uh, perhaps on a hand uh, on an elderly person in a nursing home who might have a skin tear. So we need to be careful about those acrylic adhesives. So we have now, as an alternative to that, we have dressings that have what are called silicone adhesives. So the difference is, is that the silicone adhesive is also quite sticky when you put it on, but it doesn't get any stickier. So it stays that same level of tackiness, no, no matter how long it's on a wound. So when you remove it then, you do less damage to the skin around the wound and you don't get that peri-wound uh, damage around a wound from constantly removing a dressing. So we would remove or we would use silicone adhesive uh, on our foam dressing for areas where we are concerned that the tissue around the wound is already damaged or is very thin and we're, we don't want it to uh, become any more damaged. So um, antimicrobials. Um, you, you will, I'm sure, have some antimicrobials in your, uh, in your pharmacies. Now, the thing about uh, wound antimicrobials is, is that we really only want these when we want to kill bacteria. And because antimicrobials are uh, toxic to all the cells in a wound. So when we want to kill bacteria, we don't really want to worry about the healing cells because we're more worried about killing the bacterial cells. So we, we use our antimicrobials, for instance, in a situation where perhaps somebody has fallen on a, a playing field and on, on the grass of a playing field and they have a, a bad abrasion or a bad graze. Now we don't know what's on that grass. So um, we might want to use an antimicrobial, um, you know, in that early stage of the inflammatory process just to make sure that any bacteria that's gone into the wound from the grass, from the road, from the pavement, anywhere where this wound has occurred. Also remember that when we cut ourselves perhaps with a knife or something like that, the bacteria that's on our skin has now gone into the wound. So we need to uh, help the wound um, to kill that bacteria. Now, as you remember from looking at the wound healing process, the, the neutrophils and the macrophages will remove the bacteria, but we, we can help that along if we feel there is a lot of bacteria in the wound, or if it has been a particular, what we might call a dirty wound site. Um, and we might want to use an antimicrobial. So the most suitable and the most useful antimicrobial in a pharmacy setting is povidone iodine, and you probably know that as inidine. And that is very suitable, very useful. It's a, um, it's a dressing that's used um, in A&E departments and hospitals, um, hugely used there. And it's very suitable for those superficial types of grazes and lacerations and superficial wounds where we want to just make sure that we're killing any level of bacteria that might be in that wound. Now you will also probably have silver dressings in your pharmacy. Silver dressings are more suitable for wounds that have got stuck in that inflammatory phase. And if you see the little diagram on the bottom there of the slide, you will see that we can have wounds that are contaminated, wounds that are colonized. So those wounds that are contaminated and colonized will be healing. All wounds are contaminated and most wounds are also colonized, but there, there's no delay in the healing process. But if a wound becomes critically colonized or has local infection, or indeed if a wound becomes systemically infected, then we must use an antimicrobial. Now, if the systemic infection, it will also need a systemic antibiotic. But a, a wound that has occurred in a dirty situation may well be critically colonized. And at that point, we might want to use silver um, 
uh, on the wound. So many of the dressings now have a silver version of them. And a new type of uh, antimicrobial now that's on the market is PHMB. And this is another, uh, an alternative to silver and an alternative to iodine. So how are we then going to choose our dressing? Well, it's really important that we think about what does the wound need. So where is the wound in the healing process? Is it in that inflammatory stage of healing? Is it in the granulation stage of healing? So what does the wound need? Does it need healing? Does it need protection? What does the dressing do? Does the dressing kill bacteria? Does the dressing um, rehydrate uh, dry tissue like, for instance, the hydrogels? So we think about what does the wound need? We think about what does the dressing do? And then we match that. So we think, is there a match to what does the wound need and what does the dressing do? And if we do that every time, um, we choose a dressing for a wound, we won't go wrong. Now, in order to know what does the wound need, we need to see the wound. So it is important that we don't try and choose a dressing for a wound, for instance, over a telephone or uh, somebody comes in and tries to describe the wound to you and says my husband or my wife or my child has a wound but they're at home but give me a dressing. That's very difficult because you need to see that wound in order to understand what that wound will need and then you can match that to what the dressing does. So before I finish, I just want to say that all those categories and brand names that have been included in the presentation are examples for the purpose of the presentation. Um, every wound is different and um, every wound needs to be assessed differently and every wound, any dressing choice needs to be decided. So we can't use those as a clinical recommendation for every type of wound. So we must make sure that we base our dressing choice on wound and patient assessment. So I think, uh, I'm wondering, are there any questions have come in? So, great, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'm going to show you uh, this. So I'm just gonna hold this up over myself. So uh, I'll be blanked out for a moment. So this is a poster that Fleming Medical have. And um, this really covers everything that's in this presentation on a poster. So it gives you pictures of the wound as it goes through the wound healing process. It talks about what the wound should look like. It talks about the treatment objectives of the wound in that stage of healing, the appropriate dressing category also for that stage of healing. And then on the back of the poster, um, there, are, uh, there is information about different types of dressings and you can make your, your choice based on those different types of dressings. So this poster is available from Fleming Medical and um, uh, it was designed by myself, so that's why I know that the presentation is, is really based on it. So I think it's very useful and it is really a summary of what's in the presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions now, if there's uh, any question, yes, Kieran? So the question is, how long should you change a dressing and how long should you change a dressing? Should it stay in place as long as possible? Great question. And uh, this, I get asked this question every time I do presentations on wound dressing. So we need to go back to thinking about what does the wound need and what does the dressing do? For instance, if I had a, uh, a graze, a small graze, I could put a hydrocolloid on that. Now I can see from that hydrocolloid, because as I showed it to you, it turns white. I can see how that hydrocolloid is working because I can see it get taking up the exudate. And I can see that um, as that white area will diminish over time, then the wound is healing because the wound, the skin is, is, is reformed underneath it. So in a case like that, I might be able to leave that on until it falls off, uh, until literally the wound is healed. In a foam dressing situation, we might leave it on for four or five days, um, depending on the level of exudate, and then we would certainly need to look at the wound underneath that foam dressing, because we are using a foam dressing 
where we might have heavy levels of exudate. The rule of thumb essentially would be is that while the wound is in the inflammatory stage of healing, we really should look at it um, every couple of days and, and, and look at the wound again. But once the wound gets into the granulating phase, really we want to leave it alone as much as possible and not disturb that granulation tissue. So when you see on a dressing box, may be left in place for up to five days or up to six days. They'll always, the dressing companies will always say up to because it simply depends on the wound itself and on the dressing that you're using. But thanks for that, it's a great question. Um, and every question we have is just where is the poster available? The poster is available from Fleming Medical and Fleming are in Limerick. You'll find their, web, their, their, their website has their address on it and their contact details on it. And uh, they free will. Of charge. Uh, it's free. Yeah, it's free of charge, and they get as many as you want to. They have other posters as well, which are very, very valuable in a pharmacy setting. So they'll send you all the posters. Don't have any more questions? Uh, okay, so I think that's the end of the questions. But if you do have any more questions, or, or if you some thing occurs to you later on, uh, do uh, email Fleming Medical and they can pass those on to me and I can give you a call or um, I th uh, help you with that. I'm just going to check is my email address, my email address may be at the beginning of this, uh, but anyway you can get me through, or through Fleming the Academy. Medical. To, or through the Academy, yeah. So thank you very much. Apologies again for the stoppages. As I said, I hope our wound healing process doesn't stop like our webinar <laughs> stopped tonight. Um, but I'd like to thank Fleming Medical uh, for sponsoring this um, and the IPU Academy. Um, and um, I hope you've all enjoyed it and you have found it valuable and interesting. Thank you.